Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Curtis. I am here joined by my co-host, Steve McRae. Say hey, Steve. Hey. Tonight, we have a very special program for you guys. Um, two very knowledgeable people are going to be talking about a controversial issue. Um, so always a good way to begin. Um, just to let you guys know, on Wednesday, January the 17th, we are having the uh, non-secular show about stand-up comedy. Um, we have a great lineup, Tony Deo, who has been on Conan O'Brien and the Late Late Show, Craig Ferguson, will be coming in to talk about the creative process that goes in from taking a joke to getting laughs. And we have Steve Lesser, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Comedy Festival. He will be um, here to talk about what goes into planning that kind of event. Um, the guests that they have, they actually have um, Shasir Zameda from Saturday Night Live coming. Um, so that's a really, really um, cool thing they're doing. And we'll be joined by Tom Keller, who um, has actually won several North Carolina um, comedy competitions. He will be coming in to um, guest co-host with us. So that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Steve um, to introduce the show tonight. Today's guests are Dr. Herman Mays and Kent Hovind. Dr. Herman Mays has a Ph.D. in evolutionary biology from University of Kentucky a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Anthropology, also from the University of Kentucky. He is an Assistant Professor of the Biological Science Department at Marshall University and a former Curator of Zoology for the Cincinnati Museum Center, with a substantial number of prior other adjunct professor positions. Ken Hovind is a younger creationist who has written a number of seminars on creationism science and holds to a literal account of Genesis and that the Earth is approximately 7,000 years old. Thanks. Thank you, sir. That's good to be here. So what we're going to do tonight, um, you guys have kind of wanted to have a, a, a slide presentation on the discussion of common ancestry and various models and how it relates to evolution of biology. What we kind of decided uh, prior to this was you each would have about 15 minutes to do a little slide presentation. And then Kent, you're on your slides, you specifically addressed questions that were given to you prior to this by Dr. Mays. Um, I have a copy of those questions as well. And then you will, be, you would, as you go through them one by one, kind of be asked those to the, to um, go over them with each other. Is that, is that kind of fine in a more of a back and forth uh, freestyle organic conversation? That's fine with me, sure. Okay. Then, ah. then what we're going to do is go ahead and Dr. Mays, go ahead and uh, screen share and we're going to mm -hmm. present you and then you have the floor about 15 minutes and then we'll kind of just go from there. So I am an evolutionary biologist and just a little bit about me and my interest. I've always been fascinated by nature and especially animals. And, and my goal in my career has been to learn more about the natural world through science. And um, over the years, I've studied uh, birds and I have students in my lab studying uh, amphibians. And we've recently done a, a project on a Sumatran rhinoceros. Uh, my field work has taken me to um, Taiwan and mainland China, Hawaii, Ecuador, um, throughout the continental United States. Um, and I really love what I do. And I, I do it to learn things about nature. And I love sharing that, what I learn with other people. So, so that's really where I'm coming from in this. And, um, and today I want to talk a little bit about is common ancestry an idea that's supported by science? So common an ancestry, what is it? Well, common ancestry is a scientific model and models make predictions of the data and consistent patterns of both similarity and differences across independent lines of evidence are the data that we see in nature that we relate to a common ancestry model. So we test hypotheses about evolutionary relationships based on these models of molecular evolution. It's not based on mere similarity alone. So just saying that common ancestry is simply a matter of the superficial similarity between two organisms is not accurate. Again, ancestry is common ancestry is a model. It makes predictions and we seek to see if those predictions of the model match what we actually observe in nature. Now a bit about phylogenetic trees. A phylogenetic tree is a diagram of relationships between organisms. And you can have it for any level of organisms. You can have phylogenetic trees showing uh, different uh, viral strains, and people build phylogenetic trees, uh, trees in virology and microbiology all the time. 
you can show phylogenetic trees showing different uh, the relationships between different orders of organisms and everything in between species whatever the tips of the tree are the taxa that we're looking at so those can be at any level they can be species families orders anything like that the nodes are the branching points of the tree and those represent common ancestors in the past if you think about what these lines are or what they represent they represent genealogical relationships so if you see there on the slide there, if you imagine zooming into a phylogenetic tree, you would see all these parent offspring relationships in the form of pedigrees. So that's what a phylogenetic tree is, but how do we construct phylogenetic trees? Now, Kent Hovind says, they just write the name and draw lines between them and this line becomes their evidence. And then he says, they compare the sequence of these letters, meaning letters in DNA, you can look at the similarity of how many base pairs are there, or you could look at simply how many chromosomes they have, meaning the organisms under in question, the total number of chromosomes, or we can look at the estimated gene count. So they're picking one that they want that matches their stupid theory the best. And then he says, if evolution is true, it seems logical, the more chromosomes we have, the more evolved. And then also goes on to say, if amphibians evolved before mammals, why do some amphibians have five times more DNA than mammals. These things suggest that that Kent seems to imply that we build phylogenetic trees based on linear relationships between traits. Like the more chromosomes you have, the less chromosomes, the bigger you are, the more DNA you have, et cetera. Is this really how evolutionary biologists construct, phyl construct phylogenetic trees? No. How do we actually construct phylogenetic trees? We use comparative data and we compare apples to apples. So that means we want to look at the same trait in different organisms. We can look at phenotypic traits. That means sort of the physical features that organisms have, or we can look at genetic traits. And we look along independent lines of evidence to do this. Um, and the same general methodology is used whether you're using genes or you're using phenotypic data as well. Genetic data, however, is more useful in a lot of ways that we can get into. Phenotypic data, however, is used often in conjunction with the genetic data. So here are some ways we construct phylogenetic trees. One is called parsimony. Parsimony is this idea that the tree that minimizes the number of changes is the most parsimonious and therefore the most likely. Um, a good analogy is if you're a 911 operator and you receive two calls from the same neighborhood that a tiger is loose in the neighborhood, the most parsimonious thing there to conclude is that it's the same tiger and two different people calling. So this is what we mean by parsimony. It's one that takes into account how many changes you would expect um, based on evolution. However, most ways we construct phylogenetic trees are, are two other ways that I'm going to explore here a little bit. One is called maximum likelihood. This is the probability of our data given a particular tree. So we look at the data and we pick the tree that maximizes the probability of that data given a particular tree topology or shape or relationships. Another one is called Bayesian inference. Here we look for the tree with the highest probability given the data. It's a bit like the opposite of maximum likelihood. Here we're looking for the probability of a tree given amount of data. And on top of this equation here, you can see the likelihood function, the probability of the data given the tree times the prior probability of that tree divided by all the possible ways you can get that data. Okay, so this gives us a probability that our tree is the right tree. We don't build trees on mere similarity, but we use explicit models of molecular evolution to evaluate hypotheses about evolution against the data. A good way to think about a tree is it's a hypothesis about relationships. And we take those hypotheses and then we test them to see how they match the data that's available to us. So maximum likelihood is one example. So a good example of maximum likelihood approach is that imagine you had a bag full of coins and half of the coins are fair coins and half of the coins are loaded coins. And the loaded coins come up heads, say, 75% of the time, where a fair coin, of course, is gonna come up heads 50% of the time. 
let's say you draw one coin and you flip it 10 times, you get 10 heads. So if that happens, what's the likelihood that that coin that you drew is loaded? Well, we can look at the probability of 10 heads given a fair coin, and that's 0.5 to the 10th power. And the probability of 10 heads given a loaded coin, or 0.75 to the 10th power, and we can calculate a likelihood ratio. So the ratio of, of one hypothesis versus the other. And here we can see that likelihood ratio tells us that our chance of pulling a loaded coin in this case, given the data, with the data that we have, is 56 times what it would be if we had a fair coin. And we take the log of that usually, so the log of that would be four. So here's an example of what that is. It's the probability 10 heads given we have a loaded coin versus the probability of 10 heads given a fair coin. So that gives us a likelihood measure for the probability of our data given a hypothesis. In phylogenetics, our observations are characters, character states. In DNA, those character states are the four nucleotides in the DNA molecule, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Um, like, it's just like determining the likelihood ratio for a fair coin hypothesis and a loaded coin hypothesis. We're determining the likelihood ratio for the data and each possible tree based on a model of character evolution. So for instance, here's an example. If you have four species, we'll just call them A, B, C, and D, these are all the possible trees that you could get, all the possible trees that you could build from four species, the topologies or the relationships between those four species. If we conduct a maximum likelihood on that, we might get these log likelihood numbers like this, and the largest one indicates which tree has the best support. So we would choose our, our second tree from the top left up there. Bayesian inference, however, is a little different. Um, it's what's the probability of a loaded coin given our data, okay? Or, or sorry, what's the probability? Yeah, it's the probability of a loaded coin given the data, or, or put another way, the probability of our hypothesis given our data. So the, the, that's what we're looking for is what we call the posterior probability. It's the probability we have our hypothesis, in this case, that the co coin is loaded, given we have 10 head flips. That's a function of the likelihood of 10 heads in a row, or 0 0.0563, times the prior probability of drawing a loaded coin. And remember, we're drawing from a bag of coins where half are fair and half are loaded, divided by the prior probability of getting 10 flips from any coin drawn at random from the bag. Okay, so this tells us that our probability that the coin is loaded is 98%. So for phylogenetic trees, we're determining the likelihood for each tree, given the data, multiplying the prior for the tree and dividing by the probability of the data summed over all possible trees. And this gives us a measure of that hypothesis against the data, that particular tree against the data. We look for the one that has the highest value. So here's an example of that. So if we have some prior probability here, we have three possible trees for A, B, and C, and these are three different ways we can arrange those. We have some prior probability. Let's say we just we don't favor one versus the other. We just have what's called a uniform prior. They're all three equally likely. And then we have our likelihood function, and we use that to get a posterior probability to tell us what hypothesis or what tree is more likely given the data that we have. So in this case, we would choose tree, tree two. And then we can do things like look for support um, for these branches on this tree. And this is through what we call bootstrap resampling or also clay posterior probabilities. This we can resample the data and tell us how often does that particular branch contain those species or those taxa on it out of all the resampling and reanalysis that we do. So for instance, here in this example, out of 100 trees where we construct from resampling the data, and I can explain that more in, in detail if, if need be, but we resample from the data and it tells us how, how variable the data is basically. And what we see is that A and B fall on the same branch 99 out of 100 times. So therefore that branch we're pretty sure of. We're a little bit less sure of the branch that contains A and B on one branch and D on the other, it's 92. But we can test basically the support we have for those branches. So that's how we construct phylogenetic trees, but what about the evidence for common ancestry? Because these two problems are a little different. Um, phylogenetic trees are sort of 
developing or testing hypotheses about relationships between organisms, but they're not necessarily directly testing common ancestry. These are our two hypotheses. We have a hypothesis based on common ancestry on the left and a hypothesis based on a common creation event that says our four taxa here, A, B, C, and D, never shared a common ancestor with each other. They were all appeared at the same time and they since diversified or went on their, their uh, path independent of the other ones. These are the two hypotheses. So the, the question is, what predictions do those two hypotheses make? And how do we test those predictions against the data? Now, one important thing to note is gene trees versus species trees. Gene trees are constructed from gene sequences. Species trees represent the evolutionary history of the species. And those two things are not always congruent. Special creation have said there's no species trees at all, at least not among the created kinds. So what does this predict for comparison among the gene trees? So we can look at a bunch of different gene trees, and if there really is some history in there, some shared genetic history, we can dig for this signal in those gene trees for that species history. Another thing to point out is a lot of times in phylogenetics, what we're looking at is neutral variation. This is variation DNA that doesn't vary with function. Lots of different kinds of, of variation in DNA is neutral. One of those types of variation in DNA that's neutral is a third position codon variation. So here's an example of something you probably all learned in high school biology. You go from DNA to RNA to a polypeptide. And each amino acid is encoded by a set of three bases that we call a codon. And you can kind of see that here. There's, there's 20 amino acids that are encoded by 64 codons. Here's kind of what you'll notice in this graph. If you look in the middle, that's the first letter of a codon. The next concentric circle out is the second letter of a codon. And the last concentric circle out from that is the third letter of the codon. So you'll see that some things like valine over on the, on the left-hand side, the VAL, you can have G-U-G and it will make valine. You can have G-U-A will make valine, G-U-C, G-U-U. All four of those codons will make valine. So that means that third position can change, can mutate, and it has no effect on the phenotype because the amino acid that it's encoding for is exactly the same. And these are the sorts of variation that we're looking for when we do phylogenetic test for phylogenetic trees. Here's how that looks. If a, there's a common ancestry, these changes are being passed on from common ancestors. If there's a common creation event and independent genetic lineages, these changes are occurring independently in each lineage. That is, one change that's occurring in, in lineage A or species A has no effect on whether or not there's a change in species B. Whereas in a common ancestor hypothesis, species A and B can share the same nucleotide change that they both inherited from a common ancestor. So these are two very different sets of predictions from these two models. Here's an example of a statistical test that was recently done for common ancestry, looking at 17 coding genes, 3,657 codons, and 50 independent data sets for primates, with one representative species per family, per gene in each data set. And they analyze these data under the expectations of either a common ancestry model or a single ancestry or a creation model. See which model better fits the data. Here's an example of that. So this is a, this might be a little technical uh, chart here, but what this is showing is how much variation there is among these data sets. And each row there represents sort of a different mutational model. So the authors of the paper didn't want to bias their results based on any particular way of thinking about codon, how codons are conserved between lineages. So they, they built different models of that, and they looked at how variable these shared amino acid codon sites are between two different groups. One group is the real data. So that's the gray area. That's the observed data. The black set of data is the expected data if there was independent ancestry. So if there was no common ancestry, the black data represents what we expect. The gray data 
represents what we actually observe. And what you can see there is the difference between those two sets of data, and it's pretty dramatic. So there's not a lot of agreement there. In fact, this is very statistically significant to where there would be sort of the worst fit in this data in only one in 40 billion chance that you get a worse fit between the data and this. Here's another example. So here's, a, here's our four tax again, and all the possible ways that you can arrange them on a tree. And here's one through 15, there's 15 possibilities. And let's say that two is the actual relationships there. So you would expect if there's common ancestry, two would come out if you look at a bunch of different genes, then there should be a phylogenetic signal that points you to the second tree. Whereas if there's single ancestry, you would think that there would be no sort of clear signal of, of one tree over the others. They all sort of look about the same. So the authors tested this idea too with the same data sets. And they compared um, to see how the, the agreement between the trees generated from the database on invariant amino acid sites and trees based on assumption of single ancestry for each primate family. And they found a very tiny p-value. Oh, here's my p-value result. So this means that there was approximately one in 40 billion chance of getting a fit between the data and the predictions of single ancestry for each family that are as bad or worse as what we observe. So it means that the single ancestry model you can safely refute based on these data. They also did another test. They did common showed how common ancestry predicts a hierarchical structure between variant sites. So that's what you would predict based on common ancestry is these variant sites, sites that vary, should vary hierarchically. They should be groups within groups, basically. Single ancestry for each family predicts that sites will have no hierarchy and vary independent of one another. So there's a statistical test they do to see how hierarchical the data set actually is. And here's the difference between those data. So here the black data is the simulated data if common, or sorry, if, a, if creation was true, if there were separate ancestries for each lineage, and then the gray part's the actual data. The p-value associated with this difference is essentially zero, meaning there's virtually no chance there's a worse fit between the actual data and the expectations based on single ancestry. So again, you can rule out single ancestry. Am I going over? You're about You're 20, about minutes, 20 right minutes right now. Ah, uh, I'll leave this. So, so here, here we go. So here's common ancestry or common design. Again, we have two models, a common creation event versus common ancestry. Here we have a whale, a cow, a manatee, and a shark. Okay, so here's our two models that we have here. Common design, you might be able to invoke a common design thing, but you would expect that common design would place the whale, the shark, and the manatee on the same branch because they're all designed for the same lifestyle. They live in water. Whereas common ancestry might not place animals with similar lifestyles on the same branch necessarily because they can have different common ancestors. That common design tree is not what we see in the data. And we do see a common ancestry data there. So I'll, I'll end there and I'll let Kent take over. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mays. Okay, yeah. Kent, uh, to make sure that you get equal time, that wasn't about 20 plus minutes a little bit. So you have 20 minutes, you can take as much of it or as little bit as you want. Um, if you want, as you go through your slides, if you want to have Dr. Mays uh, answer some of the questions that you'll be uh, talking about in your slides, that's fine as well, it's completely up to you. Okay, I think we're ready to go here. Uh, where's my first slides, brother? Cancel. There we go. All right, I'm ready to. According to evolution, things ought to get better automatically, but it doesn't ever work with computers. I know that. That's why we started the program late. Uh, so it, I, I was sent uh, 12 or 11 questions uh, that I thought were going to be coming up, so I have prepared just a couple of slides for this. My name is. Kent Hovind, I taught high school science and math for 15 years, and I have for the last 30 years been an evangelist teaching this all over the world on the subject of creation versus evolution. Kent, if I can interrupt you real quick, you're modulating a little bit. Um, I'm modulating yeah, a little bit. Uh, can you hit F5? It'll take you out of the hangout and bring you back in, and that should reset your audio. Hit yeah. F5, you said? Yeah, it should hit automatically F5. do it for you. Yeah, for your slideshow. Okay, how's that? Is that any better? No, yeah, you have to hit F5 from the Hangout window. It'll exit you out of the Hangout. And then Here, let, let Steve handle that. Okay. 
What's going on, brother? Um, he's modulating a little bit, which usually in, indicates that he's not having a good connection with the Google Hangout. So <laughs> what you're going to do is hit F5, leave the Hangout, just come back in, and it should fix that problem. You guys heard it as well, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yep. Now, now talk. Hello. Oh, much better. Much better. Oh, epically okay. better. Yeah. Okay. All right. I didn't want a kid to go through the whole presentation and not have the audio. Um, good. All Steve, right. You want to you want to you want to go back in? Um, reintroduce. Um, sure. Hovind coming in. That way we can I can just chop that uh, jumble we, good we, out. We can, we can chop it right from where he started um, talking. Actually. Well, I'm just saying, have him when, when um, Kent. If you'll come back on and just do your whole introducing yourself again. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have just, him start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Kent. Yeah. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Kent. The floor is yours. I hit F5 or what? Well, if you want to do the slideshow, you yeah. see this like this. If you hit F5, they'll just. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here tonight. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science and math 15 years. I, for since 1989 or 90, have been traveling, speaking on the topic of creation versus evolution. And I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. The earth is about 6,000 years old, and God made all of the animals to bring forth after their kind. Now, what exactly a kind is, I think, is pretty obvious in most cases to a five-year-old. There may be a few tough ones, but uh, you know, a dog and a wolf are the same kind. A dog and a canary are not the same kind. So I take the position there is absolutely zero evidence for any evolution taking place above the level of kind. Now, that may be the same as species in some instances. It might be more like genus or family in other instances. I don't know. So it's an honor to be here defending the biblical view. The 11 questions that I was sent uh, are as follows, and I'll get a couple of them in here, and then we can go back. Um, let's see, write the time down. We start here. Okay. I was asked, uh, how are consistent nested hierarchical patterns of neutral variation across different genes explained by independent creation of species? And that's kind of what uh, Herman covered for the last 10 minutes here. Most variations in a species do not confer selective advantage to individuals that possess them. Example, variations in fingerprint patterns in humans appear to give us no special advantage. So if you're aware of any variations that do give it a selective advantage or that change it into a fundamentally different kind of creature, I would like to see that, but I'm sure unaware of any variations we have ever seen that have conferred any advantage uh, and involving that would be considered a new kind. You may get some dogs with thicker fur if they live in Alaska for 10 generations because the, the cold weather selects the thick fur, but you don't get dogs with a built-in electric heater or any, no, no, no new features are there, only a, a, a selection of a feature they already had, which would be hair. So there's no, no, real, uh, no real evolution there. Variation happens within a species. I, I, I hesitate to use the word species, but this is just what I saw online about this. Variation within a species creates stability and increases the likelihood the species can adapt and survive environmental pressures. For example, disease hits the corn. Only the disease-resistant ones survive, and then pretty soon the whole field consists of those disease-resistant corn. However, it is still corn. And the resistance to the disease, the ability to resist the disease, was already in the original corn. They didn't develop the ability to resist you know, a, a fire. Uh, so resistance to pesticides is the same thing. Anybody who does pesticide work will tell you creatures gradually, populations of creatures gradually become resistant to whatever pesticide they're using, but it never changes to something else. The cockroach is always a cockroach. Never any examples. Any changes to a different kind of animal, as, uh, as Herman covered for the last 20 minutes here, are purely, as he said, imagination. You have to imagine it. This is, this is SpongeBob stuff. Just imagine that they're, they're related. Uh, classification uses a nested pattern, nested pattern of similarities. Carolus Linnaeus has come up with this. Um, he developed the whole system. Well, it's been modified since then, but the you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. His classification system is what I taught in biology class, and most biology students use or something similar to that. But they're, they're never taught that this is as far as it goes. It's an arbitrary uh, superposition that we are putting on these creatures. We look at a manatee and a whale and say, oh, they both live in the water, uh, and they're both mammals, and that's as far as we know. All we've ever observed in recorded science is whales produce whales. If he wants to believe or anybody wants to believe whales and manatees are related, that's perfectly fine. They can believe what they want. But you just stepped outside of science. 
and drawing all these lines between all these creatures and saying that this is somehow evident. The line is not evidence. What we see is bacteria produce bacteria. Insects produce insects. Snakes produce snakes. You can claim anything you want about a hierarchy or about a similarity, even if they have similar DNA. This is not proof for anything other than it could still just as easily be a common designer. Here's a uh, access today why evolution is true. They have a line between the dog and the human and the mouse at the top. Well, that line it only exists in SpongeBob's imagination. The fact is, all we've ever observed in all of recorded history is humans produce humans. Mice produce mice every time. None of these creatures shown here have ever been seen to produce anything other than their kind or to come from anything other than their same kind. So drawing these lines on the paper, I think, is very confusing to the kids. This is not evidence. Even if there are similarities in the DNA structure, that wouldn't prove anything. It still could be the same designer wrote them, wrote the code. Mice have two eyes, so do humans, so do dogs, so do elephants. So there's probably lines of code in the DNA that are necessary to make eyes on any creature. And those lines of code may be very similar. Microsoft PowerPoint has several million lines of code. Microsoft Word has several million lines of code. And there probably are maybe even millions that are absolutely identical. I bet if I go to spell check in Word and spell check in PowerPoint, it takes me to the exact same dictionary, letter for letter. That's not proof that they're related. It's proof the same guys wrote the code. So the similarity in code is not evidence for evolution. Louis Lamore wrote over 100 books. I read, I think, all of them I could find, probably nearly 100 of them. And I love reading Louis Lamore's books. I noticed some things about Louis Lamore's books as I read them. All of them have horses in them. All of them have guns. All of them have good guys and bad guys. All of them involve good versus evil. All of them use the same 26 letters of the English alphabet. I never saw a Russian letter or a, a Chinese in any of his books that I read. All of them pretty much avoid profanity. All of them have a woman, usually a beautiful woman, and all of them have a shootout. So that proves these all happened by chance when a print, print shop exploded. That's what I'm hearing on the other side. The evolutionists look at the similarities between the creatures, and I agree there are similarities, and then come to the totally wrong conclusion. So another question I was sent was, how are these consistent nested hierarchical patterns explained? Well, they have the same author. The reason the Louis Lamore books are so very similar with all these similarities is the same guy wrote the book. They're coming from the same mind. So if there are similarities in the code of a human and the code of an octopus in the DNA code, that's proof the same guy designed the human and the octopus, the same God. Second question I was sent were, and we can go back to these if Herman would like to, uh, how are consistent nested hierarchical patterns of neutral variation across different genes explained by independent creation of species? The same designer designed them and probably designed them with some of the same built-in <laughs> safety systems to be able to, to withstand certain environmental pressures. Uh, quite a few creatures are able to develop thicker fur coats when it gets cold. Okay, the horses do that, and so do the grizzly bears. Yeah, that's not proof that they're related. That's proof the same guy designed them. Chevys and Fords, as far as I'm aware, and I believe Hondas, have heaters and air conditioners in most of their cars. Whoa, that proves they evolved from skateboards. No, that proves it's a good design feature because you don't know if that car is going to hot climate or cold climate. So you put both in there to keep the people comfortable inside. So does a common designer hypothesis predict that species living in the same environment and occupying the same ecological niche should be the same? That was one of the questions that was asked to me ahead of time. Well, I've noticed that snow tires used in most parts of the world have deeper treads and, uh, and farther apart. The lines are farther apart. Tires used by most of the cars and trucks driven in snowy areas seem to have deeper and wider tread grooves. Well, it seems to hold true for other off-road vehicles as well. It even works on four-wheelers. So this is proof they all evolved from a skateboard. This is the kind of illogical thinking that's happening when someone looks at the similarities of the DNA code or the codons or the number of chromosomes or any similarities and comes to the completely wrong conclusion. Kent, if I can interrupt you real quick, are you trying to show slides because it's still still showing your second slide? Okay, neutral variation, variation within a species certainly happens, but it's still the same species. We talked about Carolus Linnaeus classification system, about drawing lines between these creatures means nothing. It's a line on a piece of paper. It's not evidence. 
and I talked about Louis Lamar's books, and I read a lot of them, nearly 100 of them. Uh, and I love reading Louis Lamar. And I noticed in his books that all of them have involved horses. All of them have guns. All have good guys and bad guys. All of them involve good versus evil. All use the same 26 <laughs> letters. All avoid profanity and all involve women and all have a shootout. So what does that prove? This is exactly what I heard Herman do for the first 20 minutes of his presentation is show all the similarities in the codons and everything and, and come to the wrong conclusion. I think it can, we could see they all have the same author. So how are these consistently nested hierarchical patterns explained? The same author. And everything that he gave for evidence on his slides, I think, could easily be explained by the same author designed the code. The creatures face similar environmental pressures. They need oxygen. They need a way to process oxygen or carbon dioxide if it's a plant. So, yes, of course, there are similarities in the code to create these. So how are the consistent nested hierarchical patterns of neutral variation across different genes explained? The same designer wrote them. That's all. Does common hy designer hypothesis predict the species living in the same environment and occupying the same ecological niche should be the same? Well, I noticed in my research that snow tires used all over the world have deeper grooves and further apart, even used on trucks. Anything driven in a snowy area, the tires are designed for that seem to have deeper and wider tread grooves, even four wheelers and off-road vehicles have this. This is proof that it's a good design to use in that environment. So if we have similarities between the whales, as far as a fat layer on our body or ability to process foods, that is not evidence of a common ancestor. Does a common design pattern of tires support the hypothesis that vehicles operating in the same environment? I just re reworded his question. And occupying the same ecological niche should be the same? No, they're meeting a common need. Um, so uh, they face the same hazards and the same similar needs. They need to drive on a slippery surface. So they, the tires designed for that. So I think the DNA code, all we've ever observed in all of human history is whales producing whales and manatees producing manatees. Now, if he wants to believe or anybody else wants to believe that whales and manatees are related or humans and humans and manatees are related or anything's related to a manatee, that is fine. You can believe that if you want, but it's not science. It is a religion. It's SpongeBob imagination stuff. Even if it's true, it's not science at that point because science deals with things we can study and prove and test and demonstrate. All we've ever seen is manatees produce manatees. There are no exceptions to that. So what specific predictions does special creationism make for comparative molecular genetic data? Well, they're really good at, the evolutionists are really good at drawing lines on the piece of paper, showing a human and a monkey and a mouse and a chicken and frog and lampy are related. Well, that's fine. You can draw any lines you want, but that's not science. All that's ever been observed in all of recorded history is a mouse will produce a mouse. Now, if you want to believe a mouse and a chicken are related because of the number of amino acids that differ, that's again, SpongeBob imagination stuff. That's not science. It's a line on a piece of paper. Here are some lines of code, just randomly selected off the internet. Computer code. Okay, here's some more lines of code. If I looked at the lines of code to do Microsoft PowerPoint and compared them to the lines of code to do Microsoft Word, I think we would discover many similarities. Uh, blogs.msds or msdn said there were about 30 million lines of code in the Mac version of Microsoft Office back in 06. Students at code.org said there are 21 billion lines of code. Is this a lot? Well, by comparison, Microsoft Windows operating system has 50 million lines of code. If we compared the lines of code in the Mac version or the Microsoft version, even though they're vastly different in how they operate, there still may be some similar lines of code. This doesn't prove they're related. It doesn't prove either one's related to Morse code. It proves that's an efficient system of getting the point across, of getting the machine to do what you want it to do, to project a number or a shape on the screen. So they're, they're doing good research on finding the similarities between these things, as, uh, as Herman did earlier here. That's wonderful. That's good research, but coming to the wrong conclusion, especially dealing with something like a DNA code, that is trillions of times more complex than a simple computer code, where really all you have is zeros and ones. Our primitive computer codes use zeros and ones, and the DNA uses uh, four, uh, C, A, T, and G. It is not, it's, it's immensely more complex. One of the questions I was sent was, what specific predictions does special creationism make for comparative molecular genetic data? 
Creationists predict millions of similar genes, that would be the code, because many creatures need similar features, like they both need eyes, ears, lungs, etc. That just proves the same designer wrote the codes. And he might have given them the ability to react to the same environmental pressures in the same way. So we may see certain things happen, like he mentioned about the mutations or the changes between comparing you know, how they react to the different environmental pressures. Okay, well, it still could be the same designer. How are creationists going about testing these predictions? Well, first place, the creationists are not demanding that their religion be taught in tax-funded schools. The burden of proof is on the followers of the evolutionism religion. You guys are demanding that we all pay for your religion to be taught. You got the burden of proof, not me. If I was demanding creation to be taught, I would certainly the burden of proof would be on me. I'm not. I just think kids ought to be taught science in science class, which says dogs produce dogs. Everything beyond that is a religion. If you want to believe dogs and bananas are related, that's okay, but it's not science. Is there any conceivable data that would be inconsistent with the idea of special creation? Well, yeah, there is. The Bible says the plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. If we could see any plant or animal violate that, that would prove it can be violated. Do you know of any examples? Uh, either one of you or anybody you know, has anybody ever seen an example, not by drawing a line on a paper, but where you actually watched an animal or plant bring forth something other than its same kind. Now we can see little variations, but that's and, and imagine that it, over longer periods of time, it might become a different kind. They've seen all kinds of variations in the horse kind, where we have race horses and quarter horses and you know Shetland ponies and miniature horses, and but always a horse. Uh, American Kennel Association now recognizes 339 breeds of dogs from Chihuahuas to Great Danes or whatever's the biggest one. But they're always still a dog and they always bring forth a dog and they have the same dog characteristics, four legs, a tail, two eyes. They never bring forth a bird or a feather or anything outside what well, anybody, even a five-year-old would consider the dog kind. So yes, the Bible clearly says they will bring forth after their kind. I am unaware of anybody anywhere who has seen an exception to that. Now they draw pictures about it and they draw these artist conceptions of a missing link, but an artist conception is not observable science. What we see, and every farmer on planet Earth, every farmer in recorded history has counted on evolution not happening. When he crossbreeds his cows, he expects to get a cow. If you know of any examples, I think that would violate the Bible. Yes, sir, that would prove the Bible wrong. Please show me where this has happened. I would like to see that, okay? So eighth question I was given. Why would scientists across different faiths, or none at all, come to an overwhelming consensus on the idea of common ancestry if there were no compelling evidence? Well, maybe they've never seen my seminar, seen my DVDs. That would solve it. So I appreciate you guys advertising for me. Tell them to watch drdino.com. Once they watch my videos, we can get them straightened out. Okay. Should scientists measure their findings against the Bible before accepting those results? It couldn't hurt, and it might help, but it should not be required. Nothing in the Bible has ever been proven wrong, and scores of Bible passages involving history or biology have been proven right. For instance, they'll bring forth after their kind. God said that in the first chapter of the, well, first three chapters, well, first chapter of Genesis, 10 times, the first chapter of the book, he said the plants and animals will always bring forth after their kind. I think that's a scientific prediction made by God himself. And I don't know of anybody, and if you have one, I want to see it. Not a drawing, I want to see it. The Bible is not a biology book. But when it makes a statement touching any topic, it's always been proven right. It's not a math book. It's not a history book. And it's some it, when it covers history, it's right. Nobody's ever proven anything wrong historically or biologically from the Bible. If you know of something, please tell me. So is the Bible the fi uh, final authority in science? No. It is always right on science, but there's many things. Science is a broad field of study involving many, many disciplines. And the Bible doesn't, doesn't address many of them. Just, it's not it's not on that topic. Just like my owner's manual for my Chevy doesn't deal with, you know, how to build a computer. Uh, so how do you explain Christians, if Pope is a Christian, such as Pope Francis, who see no impediment to being a Christian imposed by accepting evolution, whatever that word means, as an explanation for our biology? Catholics in general, and popes especially, have a long history of being wrong on topics relating to the Bible and to science. For instance, the selling of indulgences to forgive sins. That is not in the Bible. They are wrong. The idea of a purgatory, that is nowhere found in the Bible, that is wrong. The idea that the Pope or the priests are above everybody else, that is wrong. We're all children of God if you're saved. 
about wine actually becoming the blood and bread actually becoming the flesh of Christ. No, that's wrong. It's not true. It's not scientifically true, and it's not biblically true. So I, I, I don't know that I would put Catholics are not in the Christian category just by virtue of being a Catholic. A Christian is one who has Christ inside, uh, born again. And most of them are trusting their church and not the Lord as their Savior. And as far as the word evolution, I think we probably should have early in this discussion defined exactly what you mean by that. I'd like to see Herman's definition of evolution. Um, I, I could very clearly break it up into six parts, cosmic, chemical, uh, stellar, uh, organic. Somewhere, somewhere in your theory, life has to get started from non-living material. That has to be part of your theory. If it's not, and they, they, lately they're saying, well, that's not part of evolution. Okay, well, then help me get that other part out of the books because the books are still teaching it. I've got hundreds of high school biology books from 1880 on, and trust me, in the last 50 years especially, they do teach life came from non-living material. So it, it's an essential part of the evolution theory. Then you have what I call macroevolution, changes to a different kind. Nobody's ever seen that. They imagine it, and they draw pictures of it, and they draw lines on paper, but we've never seen a dog produce a non-dog. Period. Now, microevolution, which is variations within the same kind, well, that happens all the time, but they're always limited. People sometimes get taller or shorter depending upon diet or depending on genetic code. There's all kinds of things to influence whether a person's going to be, you know, six foot tall or five foot eight. But there's nothing in the gene code going to make a person 400 feet tall or two inches tall. There are limits, small and large. So I'm not aware of any evidence for evolution. And if the Pope has accepted it, shame on him. He's wrong. Tell him to give me a call, 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3, and I'll straighten him out. Okay? I don't know how long that was, but that's long enough. That's about equal, actually. So thanks, Ken. Okay. So, so Dr. Mayes, do you want to um, pick a particular uh, question out of these? I have the questions here, so I am familiar with them. Do you want to pick, take one and kind of run with it and do kind of a little rebuttal and a redirect? Uh, sure. So the beginning thing is, is Ken... Kent seems to be continuing on this notion that mere similarity alone is how evolutionary biologists build phylogenetic trees, despite the fact that I explained that that's not how we build phylogenetic trees. If you go back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were what we call phonetic approaches to uh, building phylogenies that were based on just similarity. Nobody uses those methods for decades, hasn't used those methods for decades. And we certainly don't use phonetic uh, methods based on simple similarity in molecular phylogenetics. Um, molecular phylogenetics poses hypotheses that make predictions of the data, and we measure those hypotheses against the data, just like I said. We either do it in a likelihood framework, getting the probability of the data given a particular hypothesis or tree, or the probability of the hypothesis or the tree given the data. Well, let's, let's ask that to Kent. Kent, do you, what is the data that you have that's comparable to what Dr. Mays had as far as the young earth creationist um, hypothesis and the experimental and observational data that shows um, what your hypothesis be correct or not? Well, yeah, I think I, I saw everything he presented. I think I heard it and understood it, but I don't think he caught what I said. What he said is we're drawing the inference of these trees. First, he's assuming that a tree exists at all. All we've ever observed is dogs produce dogs. Nobody's ever seen anything other than that. Never. Well, yeah, so that is that is science. Drawing a line on a piece of paper saying dogs are related to, to anything else is simply imagination. This isn't science. Doc, Dr. Mays, would we expect a population of dogs to have anything else other than dogs? Well, there's a couple points on that. One, um, of course, organisms within a generation give birth dogs in one generation will give birth to dogs the next generation. Um, that's obvious. And in fact, if that didn't happen, if dogs didn't give birth to dogs or what we call like doesn't beget like, that's a fundamental principle of genetics that is essential for evolution to work because if offspring did not resemble their parents, we couldn't have evolution by natural selection take place in the first place. But I'm not really here to talk about natural selection per se, I'm here to talk about common ancestry. Now, the other thing he said was that if he can 
if we can show him any evidence of that actually happening, because that's the norm where within a generation, one species gives birth to offspring of the same species. There are exceptions to that, that he seems unaware of. Um, so plants, for example, are well known to have hybridization events that produce offspring that cannot, are reproductively incompatible with either parent species that produced them. And they can only reproduce with other hybrids. So within a single generation, they become reproductively isolated from their parents and it is speciation in a single generation. And that would macro evolution? Hmm? So would that be a macro evolution due to polyploidy and whole genome? Well, that's, a, that's the other thing. That's a speciation event. So that's speciation by hybridization. Macro evolution also can't, doesn't seem to understand what it is. He says it's changed to a different kind. Now, I have a question for Ken about macro evolution. So Ken, would you, would you think it's fair to conclude that, I don't know if you're a bird watcher, but if you've seen any sort of wood warblers, you know, around your home, or, you know, sometimes if you're down south, maybe in the wintertime, you see wood warblers, um, different kinds of wood warblers that are around in North America, would you say that they, it's, it's reasonable to conc conclude that they came from a wood warbler common ancestor, a single wood warbler common ancestor? Well, I, uh, Steve, am I on here? Can you hear me okay? Um, still a little modulating. You may want to reset one more it's time. It's modulating but, again. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Hang on. What happened again? That's okay. We can filter that out. Technology. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, it's, it's are, we, yeah. are we back? Yeah, hello, better. Hello. Much better. Much better. Oh, much better. better. All right. Just stay right here, Steve. Okay. Um, you uh, we got four or five topics started here in that last uh, interchange there. You said, of course, dogs produce dogs. In one generation, that would be the norm. Well, what about in five generations or 500 generations? Or how many generations of bacteria have they raised in the laboratory or fruit flies? They did that one for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations, which is, you know, compressing tens of thousands of years of human reproduction down into one observable lifespan of, of flies. OK, so of, and what you said, of, you said there are exceptions to the idea of something producing and you use plants as an example where they're reproductively incompatible with their parents. It is still a plant. I would bet a five-year-old would call it the same kind of plant. Now, you may decide it's a new species, and somebody may decide that this is a new species of plant, like, I don't know which one you're referring to, broccoli, cauliflower, et cetera, probably all related, but it's still the same kind. It's a plant. Oh, okay, so, so if, if, all, if then it's still a plant, and would I'll change my woodworker question to a plant question, Okay. Because there's just still plants, would it seem reasonable to you that all plants share a single plant common ancestor? No, I'm not sure how many kinds of original plants there were, but... Uh, Let's say all orchids. Would all orchids be reasonable to you to share a single orchid common ancestor? Well, orchids are a very interesting plant, as you know, you know, uh, uh, able to survive on top of other plants with no well, roots. I'm, I'm not ground. asking how interesting they are. I'm asking you, do you find it reasonable to conclude based on your view of this that all orchids could stem from a single orchid common ancestor uh, I, I don't know that i could answer that question quickly uh, i think that uh, well how about all grasses could all grasses share a single grass common well, ancestor? Let's, let's assume just to pick a number that god made 100 different kinds of grasses from bamboo down to the microscopic grass I don't know how many kinds he made, but if he made 100 kinds of grass, and they have now diversified into 5,000 species, like there's over 1,000 species of bamboo. Cut, cut. You're, 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 Just, you're really, Mike is really, again, again. Really, I don't know what's going on with it, but it's, it, it works well for like a minute, and then. Uh... Every time we change, it does it. Yeah, whatever you're, whatever you're okay. switching. Um, that's, that, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, now, yeah, something. Well, we should just let it evolve. It should get better. Um, the uh, there are a thousand species of bamboo, recognized species of bamboo. I don't know how many varieties or kinds of bamboo God made, which would be in the grass family, as you mentioned about the grasses. So I think that would be a valuable field of research that probably biologists should do. Well, how many original created kinds were there? Do you know any kind, any created kind that you could define besides a human being? Why besides the human being? I think the human being well, is obvious that you're going to, I mean, 
Okay. Do you know of it? Okay. Do you know of any? Do, okay. Do, can you give me any examples where a human has produced something other than a human? No, like I, said, I can't give you any examples of of organisms. I mean, that's an essential part of evolution that organisms uh, have offspring that are like themselves. If they didn't do that, then evolution wouldn't work because that means that any mutation that occurs in one individual wouldn't be passed on to the next generation and wouldn't have the opportunity to spread. So the fact that individuals produce offspring that look like them is absolutely essential to evolutionary theory that work. And that goes back to Darwin. He recognized that. My question is about macroevolution and whether or not you understand what it is. So would there be any group of organisms that you would say it's reasonable to conclude that they share a single, even created kind? Well, let's take the most obvious, humans. Do you know of any humans that have ever produced a non-human or have no, ever come from a non-human? I don't expect them to. Well, then there's, they should, if evolution is true, this falsifies your theory. No, oh. not in a single generation. You're, you never, okay. you never qualified this idea that, that like begets like it is some, there's some generational uh, limit on it that you just said dogs give birth to dogs and dogs, you know, that's it. So that leads everyone to believe that you're talking about a single generation. No, humans, you have like individuals from one generation to the next. But do you believe humans came from something that was non-human? You can have as many generations in the past as you want to imagine. Let's yes. go back 400 trillion yes, generations. Indeed. But I'm asking. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get you to answer a question about macroevolution and what it is. Because I'm trying to get you to answer a question. Yeah, I think humans evolved from a non-human ancestor, and each generation during that process, that branching tree, um, phylogenetic, bifurcating process of populations, each generation, individuals were giving birth to individuals that are like them. So Can throughout the process of change, within <laughs> generation, individuals were giving birth to individuals that are like them. So, so I'm I have a mutation, if I have a mutation in my germline, I'm going to pass that on to my offspring. That mutation is new to me. And I'm going to pass it on to my offspring because of this rule that offspring resemble parents. Now, okay. over time, mutations start accumulating in different lineages. And if two lineages become independent and they don't have gene flow anymore, they're going to diverge and become more different from one another. But within that process, each generation, individuals are giving birth to offspring that resemble themselves. Now, again, I'm trying to ask you about macroevolution. Is there any group, grasses, wood warblers, orchids, that you would think it's at least reasonable to conclude? Like, would it be, for instance, would you think that if there was some creationist research on grasses, and they concluded that all grasses share a single grass common ancestor. Would that go against any of your beliefs in the Bible or anything? Well, the Bible uses uh, the Hebrew word was baromenology, which is translated kind. They bring yeah, forth I'll after their kind. Okay. As I mentioned, there are a thousand varieties or species of bamboo. There might have only been one variety in the original creation. I don't know. Maybe there were 50. Okay. Now, you, but, let's, let's, okay let's, let's, you talk a long time. Let's, let's, all, you give me equal time here now. Okay. You mentioned wood warblers. Let's take the wood warbler. Do you believe, and you can have all the trillions of years you want, go back and imagine anything you want. Do you believe wood warblers are related to grass? Yes, but they don't have trillions of years because that's that's absurd. There's no evidence okay. of trillions of years. I'm how asking long, you a question. How long, how long ago were they related, and what did this common ancestor between a bird and grass look like? The common ancestor between plants and animals goes back to the origins of the eukaryotes. And okay. that's not really a subject that we're here to discuss, but that's a eukaryotic ancestor. It was neither a plant and neither an animal. It was a eukaryotic organism. Now, is this something you have scientific observation for or something you yes. believe? You have like observation of it. We have, we have clear evidence for common ancestry because there's two models at play here that are competing with one another against the data. One, individuals or populations or species kinds, whatever you want to call it, appear independent of one another at the same time and develop independently. They have a, they have an independent genetic trajectories. That's a creationist model. The other model is common ancestry, that in, uh, species have common ancestors in the past. 
those two models make entirely different predictions of the data. Now, well, I'm, I'm trying to get you to answer this question that at least admit that it's not, you don't have anything against the idea that there was one created kind of grass that evolved into all the grasses we see today. Okay, I answered the question three times. I'll answer it once more. I don't know how many original created kinds there were. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you all the grasses came from a kind of grass. Okay, I there okay. might have, and I've said okay. it, there might have been 50 original so kinds of grass. In that case, if, if you're willing to accept that all grasses came from a single created I'm grass not, I did different. not say that. I'm not willing to accept that. Don't put words in my mouth. I said there might have been 50 original created kinds of grass. Okay, there let's might say have been 500. Let's say it's 50. Okay. Let's well, say it's 50, and there's thousands of species today. So those thousands of species evolved from those 50 original species. That's that. that I, I, I said I don't know how many there were, but. Well, I'm just saying, you, under, you I'm think, asking you if you, if creationist researchers decide they want to do research in this field and they discover that there was one created kind of grass or 50, do you have anything, would you have anything against, like philosophical or theological against that conclusion? No, I would say grass oh, oh. is still grass, and grass okay. always produces right. grass. Say grass is still grass. But my, the point I'm trying to make is that is macroevolution. No, it macro is not. Is not what you characterize it as. Macroevolution is diversity that we see above the level of species. So any evolutionary process that produces diversity above the level of species is, a, by definition, a macroevolutionary thing. So given that grasses have lots of different families even, and different genera and different species, their diversity is way above the level of species. So they're, if they diversified from a single grass ancestor, that by definition is macroevolution. And macroevolution involves three things. Hold it, you're taking more time. Give me a chance to respond one at a time. First of all, you are making this, this is SpongeBob imagination stuff that grasses I know came from. Phrase, but. <laughs> okay, well, it's so this true. I don't have a better this, way to this say is it. The definition. Okay. This is I didn't. SpongeBob imagination. This is the definitions from actual evolutionary biology textbooks. Okay. Macroevolution is change that results in diversity above the level of species. Well, I didn't use the word species. You did. I said kinds. Is it still grass? You said changes to a different kind. Okay, is, is it still then that's not is what it, that's is it still grass defined as a species, then you're defining macroevolution as speciation, which no, is part of the I, process I, of macroevolution. Macroevolution would be where animals produce something other than their kind. K I N D, not species. Yeah, that's dog, not what it is. A dog and a wolf are different species. Are they interfertile? Yes, well, sometimes, yeah. Most okay, well, then not. what exactly is a species? A species is a metapopulation lineage that is, we define by having an independent genetic trajectory. So what that means is that if we look at the population genetics of a potential species, if it behaves in a way that is consistent with a population genetic model is independent, meaning it doesn't show any evidence that there's gene flow between it and another population, that's a species. Being a species doesn't necessarily mean reproductive incompatibility. It just means a population lineage that goes on independent of other lineages with either not even no gene flow, but just reduced or, you know, very little gene flow. Okay. Well, let's that's take not, your definition of a species is not the definition of species. That's the, that's the what we call a, a unified definition of a species that incorporates many different other species concepts, phylogenetic species concept, biological okay. species. Okay. Well, let's take the one that's easiest to understand. Are all humans... The same species? All modern humans are the all same. Modern all modern humans are the same species. All humans are not, all, all humans that have ever existed are not the same species. If you define human as a member of the genus Homo, because there have been different species of in that genus in the past. Well, you're imagining that in the past. This is not science. It's observational science. No, tell we, us. We, we find fossils are real things that we observe that are data about the world around us. And there were different species of human beings in the past. We not only have their fossils, we have their DNA as well. But again, okay, this is getting beside the point. You're, our, you're don't, our, don't, slap, no, don't slap and run now. Let me answer each topic or somebody's going to think you're right on that one. Fossils are dead. They don't talk. They don't have a date on them. We put our interpretation on them. Just like drawing your lines on a piece of paper, you're drawing conclusions about a fossil that it was capable of doing something that no human today can do. No human today can produce a non-human. 
but yet you think something that was non-human produced a human. This is imagination. I've said that. You just did. You said the fossils could do it. I said, said somewhere. Generation, individuals are giving birth to, to offspring that resemble them. Mutations right. occur, and if a right. mutation occurs in an individual in its germline, it could be passed on to that offspring. So that offspring will resemble it in terms of that mutation as well, in terms of that change. Okay, how, how many changes? Like parents is also the way in which mutations get spread. So, oh, I understand real well. Okay, are you? Can you cite for the audience here any mut? It would take millions, trillions of mutations to turn a grass into a human. Can you? Can you tell me any well, mutations? Take trillions of mutations to turn. I mean, they they don't have even that much. I mean, some have a lot of DNA, but don't. But grasses don't turn into humans. Grasses and humans That's have a low, common. There's answer. no evolutionary model that says grasses turn into humans. None. There Not is. One. I have evolutionary pictures from my textbook showing grasses and humans related by drawing a line on a paper. They're back related. To another. They're related, but that doesn't mean one turns into the other. You are completely missing the point. Now I would like you to answer my simple question here. You're claiming all this happens because of mutations. Would you please cite for the audience and God who is listening here, what mutations are you aware of that have added new information and been beneficial and have been passed on to the next generation? Is this something you imagine like SpongeBob or can you actually cite a beneficial mutation that has caught on and changed the population and has added new information? There are enormous numbers of beneficial mutations from oh, really? sort of metabolic enzymes and bacteria to lactose tolerance in people there are mutations that uh, explain the difference between chlorophylls and, and what uh, substrates the chlorophylls will strip electrons from. Um, there's tons of different beneficial mutations and everything from bacteria to humans to fruit flies to birds to plants and everything. If well, beneficial can, it doesn't mean really what you think it means. When we talk about beneficial mutations in, in evolutionary biology, we just means that those mutations in that particular environment, in that particular population, have a relative fitness advantage. That's all that means. So my question was a little different, though. I said, are you aware of any mutations that added new genetic information? All mutations like add information. All of them do. Beneficial or negative? Are most I mutations? Just gave you examples of beneficial mutations as well. Well, lactose tolerance. I don't know that that's still going to be a human, isn't it? Uh, you just ask if mutations give beneficial information, benefic are beneficial or not. I explained okay, to you so, what beneficial means. Okay, so how is that, that going to change? To how is that ever going to change grass into a human or a common ancestor of grass and humans? How is lactose tolerance going to change whatever the ancestor was between grass and humans can, it might not but that's not what you asked can go ahead and be said okay. one more time um, so. yeah we need to well let's let it evolve here uh <laughs> should get so, better by itself. Not, it might not lead to a new species but natural selection is a change occurring within a population is different than the speciation process you just asked for if there are beneficial mutations that's a totally different question than whether or not those mutations will lead to speciation. They may or may not. You well, just they're beneficial and they are. Okay, let's keep this in the line where the average person can understand it with humans again. Are you aware of any, uh, and I would point out in a, in a court of law, no fossil would count as evidence for anything because all you know is it died. You couldn't prove that fossil had any children. And you certainly couldn't prove it had children that were different since all animals today produce the same kind. Humans produce humans, monkeys produce monkeys. So why would you think a fossil could do something other than that? So I, I would discount all fossils as, as non-evidence for evolution. We observe 7.4 billion people on the planet today, many of them having children, and they always produce humans. And I as realize, far as any- I realize okay, that. That's, that, all that's, that's all that's ever happened. Exactly, exactly what evolution would expect. That's exactly what creation would expect, too. They bring forth after their kind. Sure. And but let's, talk about, let's talk about the other things and the topic of the actual discussion that we had agreed to have, and that's the evidence for the comparative merits of the two models, a single ancestry creation model versus a common ancestry one. Now, well, you keep right. making claims that of, of these changes somehow are there for a reason, but I'm not sure what that reason is. If we're talking about synonymous neutral variation, 
how does that variate? How would you expect that variation to vary among different created kind lineages? Very good question. Give, give a satisfactory uh, answer to that. Okay, I'll give you one. I would expect the creator to design the original created kinds with the ability to adapt to a variety of environments. Some of the humans that came out of Adam's loins. I have to stop you right here because I'm not talking about adaptation at all. I'm talking about whether or not neutral variation that has no effect on natural selection at all, how that, what that tells us about ancestry. It has nothing to do with natural selection. I'm only think, talking about those genetic markers that are neutral. Sure. Okay, I don't know that would necessarily tell us anything about history. You could imagine, you can put your interpretation on it. What we see are dogs produce dogs. Some live in cold climate, some live in warm climate. Some have thin fur, some have thick fur, some have long Again, legs, some have short legs. Uh, that's not I agree. Uh, natural natural selection can, uh, can only- uh, Hang on, if I, if I, if I may, I, let me see if I can clarify this because I think you guys are talking past each other, if I may, if that's okay. Kent, what he's mm -hmm. asking you, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, natural selection doesn't act on neutral mutations. It only acts on beneficial or detrimental mutations. mutations. So he's asking you, if you have neutral variation, um, then how do you have these nested hierarchical patterns? Because natural selection is not going to act upon them. Is that what you're asking, well, Dr. Mays? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, and I asked, what exactly beneficial mutations is this natural selection working on that's going to change? I'm not talking about beneficial mutations at all. He said about neutral mutations. Neutral mutations. With respect to the environment. Okay. Well, if neutral mutations do nothing, why are we talking about it at all? Is that going to add up to something? A bunch of neutral... Med Are you now counting on neutral mutations to add up to changing it to a new kind? What kind yeah. of neutral mutations would change a grass, uh, the ancestor of grass and humans? Uh, into they, they wouldn't. That's not the point. That is the, the point. point. The point is that that's data, and you have two competing models, common ancestry and independent origins, which is the creation model in this case. We have genetic variation. We have genetic variation that doesn't have any, doesn't vary with function. So you can't just easily dismiss it by uh, talking about natural selection or function or design because it doesn't have any influence on design. It's the same product in every gene, but the genes vary still. Now the question is, what does that variation tell us about those species history? Is it more consistent with a common ancestry model or more consistent with a special creation model. Okay. And all you can do is talk about natural selection, which is not the point. Okay, all of the variations ever observed in human history leave the creature, whether it be plant or animal, in the same kind. Horses, zebras, quaggas, I don't know what all kinds of horses there are, and they're still interfertile in some cases. They get zorses and zonkeys and z-donks, by, they don't normally crossbreed, but they can. And I think a five-year-old kid could show you that a horse and a zebra are the same kind of animal, and they're a different kind than frogs and grass. I think a five-year-old could show you that. I'm sure so they yes. could, but I'm, but, but I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about a five-year-old's understanding of biology. I'm here to talk about an adult person's education, educated version of biology. I get five-year-olds understand things like a five-year-old will understand them. I'm here to talk to you about the science. And the science says that you have two models, they make different predictions of the data. And when you look at neutral variation, so the, the, the reason we're looking at neutral variation is to eliminate this possibility of selection explaining the pattern or even design explaining the pattern and things like that. That's the whole reason we look at that. So let me give you an example. Do you think that if you submit your DNA to ancestry.com or one of these services that they could take that DNA and place your genome in the context of some population history, human population history. And how do you think they do that? Well, I think they would very quickly trace mine back to Norway, I think, because all four of my grandparents came over from Norway. I get it. But, but how, how is that done? How, what sorts of genetic markers do they use to trace your ancestry to certain populations? Well, I don't know the details on how they exactly do that, but I know we have DNA similarities between all you the Norwegians. Well, the DNA is incredibly complicated. I can I tell you at, how they do it. Well, I, I'm not interested right now. I think if you look at the, the lines of well, code for my, how, I asked you a question and you said you don't know. So well, let, let me, me have, no, let me give you the answer that I have. You just said you don't know how they do it. That well, was the question. 
It's incredible. The DNA is incredibly complex, but I'm trying to get you to, you to see a bigger picture. Comparing similar DNA between me and all other Norwegians might prove there are genetic markers that all Norwegians have and all Namibians do not have. Okay, that's probably true, but we're still human and we're still interfertile. That, but that's you not don't get it. You do not get it. Humans produce is, humans. The point you don't is, get it. DNA is complicated and there's a lot we don't know, but this we do know. Okay. We can use neutral genetic variation to place your genome in the context of a particular population history and sure. the exact same methodology using that same neutral variation is the type of variation that I'm talking about when we look deeper into evolutionary history, differences between species and or common ancestry between species and families, et cetera. It's the right, same right. technique. I understand, heard every word and understand. Now, so the, the similarities that I have with other Norwegians, even though I've never been to Norway, that same type of data you're going to use to prove that humans and grass are related if you go back far enough. Is that your, is that your variation? Yes. And that's, there's a reason for that because it's the same process. It's the same process. We can look for patterns of common ancestry when we look at neutral genetic variation. Again, it's two models and the data are only going to support, they're going to support the predictions of one model or the other. Now I haven't heard your model necessarily make any clear predictions. Okay, I'll make one right now. I predict humans will always produce humans. Every, no matter what climate you go to, no matter what country you go to, no matter how far back in history you go, you will never see an example, never, in the, where a human has produced a non-human or come from a non-human. Well, Ken, I need That's predictions. My prediction. that we can, I need predictions that we can test without the benefit of a time machine. Go to the hospital. The go, go, to the, go, to the, right go to the go to the maternity ward. Go to the maternity on the ward. Data we have right now. Okay. What predictions does your model make of the of the data when it comes to neutral genetic variation? My model predicts humans will produce humans and the mutations. That's not what I'm asking. That's not what I'm asking. He, he's oh, that's no, no, you mean that's not what you want to hear? No, he's, no Ken, yeah, that's not the question Ken, I'm asking. Kent, it's, not, the, it's not the question he's asking, actually. He's asking you what you can do now um, to provide experimental data that supports your hypothesis of what you're trying to put forth for the young Earth creationist position. I go to any maternity ward and watch when the baby's born. It will be a human. But that's consistent right. with the evolutionary I prediction that as well. <laughs> that is consistent <laughs> with the idea that humans and grass have a common ancestor? Come on. You've got to be kidding. What? You can, believe, you can believe humans and grass are related if you want, and you can draw lines on your paper, and they do, showing yeah, plants and this, humans this are related. That's not science. Thing, the SpongeBob stuff is just, it's not cutting it. These are, these are, these are slogans that you use. It's meaningless. I've told you, it's, phylogenetic it's, biologists don't merely just draw lines on paper. Well, let me they ask you, let me, yes, do, they do. Dr. Mace, I me, explain to you how it works. Dr. Mace, let me ask you. Let me ask this question to both of you. Then, um, mm -hmm. I think both of you would agree that humans produce humans, and, and monophyletically will continue to produce humans. So the question would be, if if the young Earth creationist position is correct, if the hypothesis that they're putting forth is correct, there has to be something distinguishing it from the evolutionary model. The evolutionary model says that humans produce humans and will continue to do so because it's a nested hierarchy. So what what would be something that you would suggest, Kent, that an experiment can be done, an observation can be done that separates it from the evolutionary theory? To make it distinguishable so you can say evolutionary theory does not predict this my model does therefore my model is better or more parsimonious right and i, and I might add it, it's it needs to be predictions that we can measure against the data we can have right now we, we can't use some time machine to go into the future and look at what humans may or may not look like but the data we have right now that we can access right now how would we test your hypothesis okay the data we have right now is 7.4 billion humans on the planet, many producing babies, which are humans. We have about five or 6,000 years of recorded human history where people have kept records of humans producing humans. Anything other than that is outside of observable science. You can imagine that these mutations, positive, negative, or neutral, can change it from grass to a human or from a grass-like ancestor to human, but this is not science. Ken, what, you, what you don't understand is that it's not the mutations that are changing anything. The, the mutations in this sense that we use to test models of common ancestry are merely markers of history. They have no role in, 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 in changing. They're just sort of a byproduct of, of speciation. They're not the cause of speciation. And so it's the same, the same principle 
allows us to test your Norwegian ancestry or put part of your genes in Africa or part of your genes in Asia or wherever. And it's the same process. These are merely markers of history. And what we know about genetics tells us that lineages accumulate mutations over time. So these mutations, and if those two lineages never shared the same gene pool, meaning they never shared a common ancestry, they will be accumulating changes that are independent of other ones. That looks very different. That we have very different expectations for what the data looks like in that case, compared to they inherited a certain change from a common ancestor. That's an entirely different uh, prediction for the data. Again, these aren't causing things to turn into other things. They're merely markers of history in this case. And so well, and the question is, are those markers consistent with your model or a common ancestry model? I haven't really gotten a clear answer on that other than you just believe that your model is right. I haven't heard a clear path or research program that you could implement uh, to where what data you could collect to, you know, test okay. this idea. Well, my model is that every animal or plant will always produce after its kind. And there'll be variations within that yeah, kind. I, 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 you, you keep saying that over and over again. and I Because I, it's true and you're not getting it. No, I do. Humans, you do not get it. Dogs produce dogs, and you believe dogs and grass are related. And you teach students that, and you use tax dollars to do it. Man, go start a private school and teach that stupidity to kids who want to learn it. That's not science. Uh, F5 science F5 is what we observe, study, and test, and demonstrate. That's not science. Kent, it's a religion. Kent, you have a religion, Herman. Admit it. Go F, ahead. F, F5 again, Kent. <laughs> I, I don't know what's wrong with your oh, mic. but it's, F5, hang on. Yeah, but it's, F5 really kind of helps a lot. No, we'll leave here. <laughs> the worst time too i know i was i wanted to hear what Ken had to say too and these okay. robotics okay i was oh, i was just go. pointing okay. out there we go i was just Perfect. pointing out that this is his religion this isn't science humans produce humans and dogs produce dogs and if he wants to think humans and dogs are related that's fine but he shouldn't be teaching this as science and he shouldn't be using tax dollars to do it it's not part of science science is what we observe you can believe that and you do I, 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 you I, believe I, humans I, and grass I, are related that's you, fine I can show you all the observations you want I've, I've been showing you observations. The data that I just show you are observations. Those are sequences that we get from living things. And we compare them in a way that's either consistent with one model or consistent with another model. I understand. And in an overwhelming case, uh, some of these tests have p-values to where you'd get a worse fit with a, with a creation model, about one in every 40 billion chance of getting a worse fit between the data and that model. Sure, so, and you're welcome to believe whatever you want to believe. You can use any models you want to believe, but observable science tells us I dogs produce it. dogs. I observe the data. That's so an that's, observation. DNA sequences are observations in science. Those DNA, are observations. We okay, build I, models. I we build models to explain diversity. Okay, and those well, models I, are predictions. And the, the observations we get are the data we collect. So this is entirely observable. What if I went through Louis Lamour's book and found out how many times he used the letter O per thousand the letters? It have nothing to do with it. Well, it does indeed. Sentences, it does indeed. Similarities between sentences and books and Louis Lamour and movies and whatever else you want to bring up is completely irrelevant. This movies is what you're doing with DNA. It's a, it's a code. DNA is a code. Irrelevant. It's the same thing. No, you're it's doing not the same thing. Yes, it is. Come on. Do We've got an hour and, we, we, an hour and a half, have, guys. We'll, we'll, do books have sex and hey, reproduce? Okay. Hang on. Uh, um, we've got wait, an hour and a half. Hold, one sec. F5 yeah. again? No, uh, is he okay? What? You're good. I don't know. I'm here. Uh, uh, yeah. Are, uh, I think we've, uh, we're, we're hitting kind of a, a brick wall here. Um, all right. There are uh, there were some people who have submitted um, some questions um, that we've kind of gone through. Would you guys be okay with answering uh, a couple yeah. of those. Yeah, sure. Real quick. Okay. Um, the question is going to go to um, Kent. Okay. And um, it says, we see a layer of iridium found everywhere all over the world. If you're following the, uh, hold on one second. If you're following the version of the Bible, where is this global layer supporting a flood? Well, iridium is very interesting. It's a rare element. There's a long article about this on ICR, which is Institute for Creation Research, icr.org. Um, I think if you had a global flood, 
uh, accompany uh, catastrophic uh, events, especially launching stuff out into space, probably from the uh, hydroplate theory, which I cover in my seminar. You can go to Walt Brown's website, creationscience.com. He's also got a long article about the iridium. If you want to study specifically, creationscience.com. Walt Brown, PhD in physics, taught at the Air Force Academy for years and is a creationist. So I don't know that I could tell you. I, knew that, I do know that all over the world there are layers of, of rock, uh, and that indicates rapid deposition, oftentimes containing fossils, which indicate rapid burial before they had time to decay. So I think it's very clear evidence of a, of a flood with rapid uh, deposition of layers, including polystrata fossils, trees standing up, petrified, running between these layers. He'd watch my seminar. That's why the Pope believes in evolution. He's never seen my seminar. If he watched that, it would, it would save the planet. Okay. Um, and Dr. Mays, um, <laughs> what is your opinion on a missing link? Do you think there is sufficient evidence showing that there is no missing link anymore, or do you think there is still a missing link? Missing link for what? Did they specify they didn't specify, but I'm assuming they're talking about the – yes, uh, that's what I'm assuming that they're talking about. Missing link is sort of a terrible term. It's, it's, it's one of these buzzword terms from and, – and, and sometimes even among evolutionary biologists, they use it pretty care, carefree. Um, evolutionary biologists use a lot of terminology sometimes very loose because they understand what they mean. But sometimes when they use it, they don't realize that the people listening to the term don't necessarily understand what they mean. Missing links imply a very directional, uh, goal-orientated, progressive sort of idea of evolution that isn't really how evolution works. Um, what we look at in the fossil record is we look, we, we find evidence of traits that are transitional. Not species that are transitional, but character states that are transitional. And what we find in the fossil record are, are species that have a mosaic of characteristics between two groups that we thought might be pretty different. Those are the sorts of, that's the sort of evidence that we have in the fossil record that supports common ancestry um, and supports change over time. But missing links are not necessarily our direct ancestors. They're just, they're just evidence of uh, character evolution, basically. That said, we have enormous <laughs> amounts of evidence in the fossil record for common ancestry and transitional states in various, all kinds of characters and characteristics in all kinds of different organisms. So there's, and in humans, the fossil record, because of where humans in the past lived was amenable to fossil, fossil, fossilization, and also because there's just so many people interested in humans, there's more people looking for those fossils. So we have a we have an enormously rich and uh, record of, of human evolution. And Kent, did you want to follow up on um, any of that? Yes, is my need F five again? Am I okay? No, you're good. You sound good. Oh, good. good. Well, first place, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are a lot of fossils, but it's it's us putting an interpretation on them. Uh, that's easy, just as easily explained with a global flood, which would, of course, automatically sort creatures by similar body density or similar habitat. You would expect to find birds in one layer, as generally the top layers, because they 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 fly. They don't they that's how they run out of gas. Of course, they don't drown first. They drown last. And you'd expect to find fish lower than birds, which would not necessarily mean one evolved to the other. It's just hydrologic sorting or just by, by habitat or by body density or by intelligence. Uh, there's no evidence of any change over time. And even if there were, uh, using a fossil to make to claim it's some kind of a transition, this is ludicrous. Wouldn't hold up two seconds in an honest court of law. All you know is the creature died. You don't know it was the ancestor of anybody. And all we observe is dogs produce dogs and cows produce cows. You can believe they're related if you want and draw a line on paper if you want. But that's not science. Science is things we observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Go breed your dogs and breed your cows and come up with something other than a cow or a dog. It's never been, and they've tried. They've tried and tried to get faster horses for racing. So far, all they've ever been able to get is a horse. Why don't you breed wings on it and fly around the track? If I can, that, add, if I can ask, uh, Ken, because you have mentioned this before. Sure. If we do find a fossil, why does it matter if that particular fossil has had offspring or not? My point would be in a court of law, you could not prove that it is the ancestor of anybody. Why would it, my question is, why would it yeah. matter, though? Well, because this is what they're claiming is their evidence for their theory. And it's not evidence for anything. It's evidence something let's, died. Let's go, let me go back to the Ancestry.com example. 
if you okay. submit your DNA to Ancestry.com, sure, and then you get the results back in the mail, and you get something that says a certain percentage of your DNA comes from this population, another percentage comes from that, and you find those results generally believable, right? Okay. Do they send you a the names of addresses of each and every one of your ancestors when you submit your DNA to Ancestry.com? Oh, I doubt that, but they're all human. I right. guarantee they're all, I, they, without right. even me. They don't. What we do is we get DNA and we can test hypotheses about relatedness that are built on common ancestry without actually showing common ancestors. So for instance, I know that you're more related to your siblings, if you have siblings, than you are to your cousins. And I know that without ever knowing who your parents or your grandparents are. Uh -huh. So if, if, if you were adopted and we could test some people who are putatively, perhaps your maybe your siblings or your cousins, we could tell them apart without ever knowing your direct ancestors. So That's knowing direct ancestry is not something that is required for evolution in the first place. You keep saying, well, the fossils, we don't know that there are ancestors. We don't know if they have kids. Sure, who cares? That's not part of how we test ideas in evolution to begin with. Like so it doesn't matter. The fossil record doesn't preserve genealogies. It preserves evidence of common ancestry. So it we, doesn't preserve evidence of common ancestry either. It preserves it preserves evidence that something died. End of story. But, it doesn't but, it doesn't preserve evidence of common ancestry. Of the fossils and their comparative analysis is what I'm talking about. Kent, let me let me ask you this: If, if you had in future generations, let's say we go five or six future generations down the line to your great grandchildren, and we okay. looked at their DNA, we compared it to a fossil of one of your cousins now that's extant now. Your cousin may have not had any offspring, but could they not tell that your great, 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 great grandchildren have a common relationship to your cousin now? Oh, I would predict without, I would bet any amount of money you want to bet that my great, 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 great grandchildren will be 100% human. That wasn't my question. That's not my question, though. My question is, are you, if we took the DNA sample from your great, great, great grandkids and we looked at your extant cousin today, could we not tell that they have a common relationship to your grandparents? They would find out that it's human DNA in every single case. Okay. There may be variations. They find out that it's human. They know it's human. They know your great, 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 great grandkids are human. They know all that. Now, what the, can they tell about the relatedness between a cousin that you had now? That's what we want to know. Not whether or not they're human, it's but what very can you tell about their relatedness? Sure. They could, they, they could tell probably how diverse they are and how far, how, how many, even they, about their relatedness. They could probably tell how many, how closely related, but they're all there within the gene code that's of it. humans. That's, that's all. That's, that's not it. That's, that's not it. you. Cause that's you're claiming you they, are claiming Herman, Herman, you're, 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 you're an ancestral sample. Direct you are, you are imagining that we are related to grass. Well, well hang on, hang on. Oh, hang on. Hang on. You guys are talking over each other, so let's let's. Yeah, on. sorry. So, so, okay. We're not so, related to grass. So, Kent, we're not. We're not talking about grass right now. We're just talking about humans. The fact he believes well, he believes on. grass and humans are related, well, but Kent, and he wants me to pay to have him teach that to kids. Okay, but Kent, I resent that. Kent, hang on. The the fact is though, you you you've said that the great grandchildren we can tell are related to your extant cousin today. If your cousin did not have any offspring, he still is a common ancestor. He still is related to your great, 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 great grandchildren. That that fossil we found from your cousin, if, if he did get fossilized, um, it didn't matter whether that cousin had offspring or not. It's still a fossil that we found that we know is related to your great, 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 great grandchildren. Would it not be that case? That is still within the kind of human. That's fine. That's that's not what we're asking. You totally agree with that. that. That's fine. Right. Yeah. Well, no, but you're the one that is trying to take these little, really minor variations with hair color and skin color and try to make humans related to grass. This is stupid. This is not evidence we're related to a whale or grass. You can believe that all you want, but you should go teach that in a religious school, not a science class. I think for I think for clarification, uh, real quick, Doctor Mays, if you would um, in a kind of a summary terms could you explain um because he keeps mentioning you know the fact that you think that uh grass becomes a human can you kind of um tell the audience um your position behind that like um why that is the case just real summary well that would branch back, off to yeah it goes back to my the whole thing i was i opened up with talking about the evidence for common ancestry and 
how we test common ancestry. So this idea that there's some relationship between humans and apes, whales and cattle, um, grass and mammals, anything, all those ideas we are hypotheses that we can test and measure against the data. And those hypotheses make predictions of the data. So one thing that we can do is we can look at the data and see if it's consistent with this idea of it's not just grass isn't grass is a very evolved species. In fact, grass is an ex, a very recent species of plant. They they you know they sort of evolved along with the mammals really at, at the end of the Cretaceous. They're they're not an old plant, so they were evolving after animals have been evolving for hundreds of millions of years. So it's silly to suggest that grasses are turning into people. Now, what we look at is whether or not, not just grasses, but all plants and all animals share a common ancestry. And that idea is an idea that makes predictions. If it were true, then the data that we observe would look a certain way. If it were not true, then the data we observe would look a different way. The data we happen to observe supports the conclusion that plants and animals share a common ancestry. And that common ancestry goes back to the appearance of the eukaryotes, which is what plants and animals and fungi and protists and other organisms are all eukaryotes. So, And, and still today, it. humans and well as plants are still eukaryotic. Yes. For that very yeah. reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so you could say, so you could say, you know, when Kent keeps saying things like, "Well, there's still plants, or there's still humans," I could say, "Well, grasses and humans share a common ancestry, evolve from a common ancestor, but they're still just eukaryotes. Plants and humans are still eukaryotes. So where does this? This is the silly thing about they're still dogs, they're still humans, they're still grasses, they're still orchids, they're still birds. That's an arbitrary thing. I can eat just as easily say that." in terms of grasses and humans and just say, well, yeah, they have all from a common ancestor, but they're both still eukaryotes. So right, let's, uh, Kit, you want to respond? Well, yeah, you, you first of all, you, you misquoted me to start the conversation. Uh, I did F5, not say. F5, F5 again, real quick. Okay. I, I want to I really want to hear your, your F5. Uh, yeah. F5. I, I hate to keep asking you, but it works. Shift F5. I, I don't know why his mic is. No, no, no. There we go. It looks right. like it's working. Yeah, it, it works for, for, okay. for a while. Okay, okay. go. Well, I think it's, the problem's on your end. Your system needs to evolve a little bit more, you know. Uh, give it a few hundred billion years, it'll be fine. Um, you misquoted oh, me to start. Uh, I did not say grass becomes a human. I said what he just said. He believes, and he admitted it, grass and humans share a common ancestor. Sure, but they're that, still just eukaryotes. It's my turn to talk. You said, and you believe, you still believe, right this moment, you believe grass and humans have a common ancestor. I did not say grass becomes a human. I, I okay. said exactly what he said. That's what he believes. Now, he said grass is a very evolved species. As far as anybody's ever observed, grass produces grass. Now, somebody might try to selectively select, they might try to select certain characteristics like faster growing if they're in a lawn business or you know, short grass for g g golf greens or something like that. They probably helped it along by selecting certain traits that they like. People have taken dog species and have selected, you know, smallness to get a chihuahua and bigness to get something. Else. But the more they select away from the normal average generic dog, the more problems they get. Most of these varieties of species of dogs or varieties of dogs that have been selectively bred in the last few hundred years wouldn't survive two days in the woods by themselves. They, they have to be babysat all the time. Chihuahuas wouldn't last one day in the woods. They'd be bear food or buzzard bait. So yes, there are variations within the kind, sometimes some pretty incredible variations. If you only found the bones, probably nobody would think the Chihuahua and the Doverman are related, but they are. They had a common ancestry and it was a dog. Now the Bible says clearly that all the animals and all the plants will bring forth after their kind. You haven't shown any evidence. You've shown a model that you have chosen to interpret as, oh, look at this similarity or the difference in the DNA, and you interpret it to mean they're related. But science deals with what we observe, and we observe grass produces grass, and dogs produce dogs, and humans produce humans. Anything other than that is your religion. Herman, I wish you'd just admit it. You believe it, and that's fine. This is America. You can have any religion you want, but you shouldn't have all of us pay to have that taught to all the kids. That's not fair. Well, Ken, 
people can sit down and talk about exactly what I've been talking about, and we do, and I've been in science for 25 years as a professional person for 25 years, and I've sat down with a lot of people. And among professional scientists, the, this is basic stuff. There is no disagreement in any of the people that I've sat and talked to for 25 years. You're sitting with the wrong crowd. I'm going to finish. And the people that I talk to come from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different religious backgrounds, a lot of different political backgrounds, a lot of different ethnic and uh, cultural backgrounds. There's no one common denominator that makes people, ideological common denominator that makes people believe in evolution. There are Catholics who believe in evolution. There are Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christians who believe in evolution. There are atheists who believe in evolution, of course. There are evangelical Christians who believe in evolution. There are Jews who believe in evolution. There are Buddhists who believe in evolution. So it's not a religious view or a worldview. You know, the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky wrote a paper in the early 70s to the American Science Teachers, a, a journal for the American Science Teachers Association. And the title of the paper was, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Outside of the Light of Evolution. Dobzhansky was an Eastern Orthodox Christian. And even today, that statement, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, is on a plaque in the science building at the University of Notre Dame on the floor, on a big tile on the floor. So this has nothing to do with people's religion. Nothing. I, it makes no difference to me. I can, I can you know, I could change my religious beliefs tomorrow and it wouldn't have any effect at all on how i view the evidence for evolution so this notion that it's a religion is nonsense it's an argument that people creationists use so that they don't have to argue the science well that was very interesting you said jews believe in evolution uh you listed a whole bunch of people i didn't write them all down but this is exactly proves my point exactly they believe in evolution this is uh, their religion I, you're right in fact, that's the one thing in this discussion that I'll give you that you have corrected me, and you're absolutely right. I lose, it's loose talk for me to say I believe in evolution. And scientists don't believe in evolution as an article of faith. I will correct myself based on that, and I thank you for bringing that up. I'm convinced that evolution is the best scientific explanation we have for biological diversity, and I'm convinced on the basis of the evidence. So thank you for correcting me. Well, any time, any time. Do I need to hit Control no, F5 you're again? Nope, you're fine. Nope. I'm fine. Yay, okay. Well, your system needs to evolve a little further. Um, and if uh, Theodore said that nothing in biology makes sense outside of evolution, I'm sorry. I, I guess he'd have to define what he means by evolution. I agree that variations happen within the kind, and they're sometimes pretty bizarre variations like Chihuahuas and Great Danes. But I would say all we've ever observed is these variations are limited to the same kind. And if you want to believe that makes grass related to humans, you can, but that's not science. You said if you changed your religion, it would have no effect at all. Herman, what would happen if you changed to be a young earth creationist tonight? Would that affect your, would they, would they fire you where you work? Mm, well, let me put it this way. Unlike AIG or ICR, I don't have an employment contract that uh, as a condition of my employment requires me to either reject or accept any idea in science. So I don't know what they would do, but I have, unlike those people with those institutions, I don't have a contract that holds me to believe in certain scientific principles and reject others. I, I have a question for, for, for Kent. It's kind of related to, um, to this. Kent, is, is it your position that you can't be a true Christian and follow the model that Dr. Mays is talking about? Oh, I didn't say that. No, I think a lot of a lot of true, honest, genuine Christians are deceived, just like he is deceived, into believing something that they've been taught. I think in the Soviet Union 20 years ago, you'd have a real hard time finding a teacher in any school that didn't believe in communism. I think in North Korea right now today, you'd have a hard time finding anybody who didn't love their dictator. I think that, that the fact that most scientists today and most biology teachers in public universities believe in evolution does not make it true. It just makes a majority opinion, or uh, it means they're afraid no, of being silenced. It's, not, it's that's not it. It's not it. Okay, it's, Why consensus, don't you say what? it's a Go consensus in. position, and there's a big difference. 
Go in tomorrow and tell your boss you have changed your mind. Just, just test it. Boss, I've become a young earth creationist. I think evolution is limited where the animals bring the same kind. I think our textbooks are wrong. We're telling them humans and grass are related. I don't believe that's true anymore. Well, can Ken, I, go I, would actually, I would actually be happy to do that. Um, Please do. Please yeah, do. I, I want to see what happens. I would be happy to do that if you actually took me up on the opportunity to give me a convincing scientific reason to be a young earth creationist. But... You haven't really answered any of my questions. So okay. you or anybody else hasn't convinced me to go into my boss and tell him that I'm a young earth creationist because I, you haven't given any evidence of these claims at all. So I'm sorry, well, but I'm you, not going to do that any more than I would walk into my boss's office tomorrow and tell him I believe the earth is flat. Because also I, there, there's no evidence. I agree. Well, Kansas is pretty flat. That's about the only place. And Texas, part of Texas. Um, but no, the earth is round and it spins. I think the flat earth idea is stupid, but that's what some people believe. Okay, they can believe what they want. Now, uh, we are way over time and I got folks waiting on me, but um, let's do this again. I think what you need, Herman, is to watch my whole video series. Maybe that would get you straightened out. How much uh, are they, Kent? I'll send you one for free. Send me an address. I'll send you one for free. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, uh, better yet, would you put it in your cl class and encourage your students to watch it? And no. And call, and call me with questions. <laughs> no, I'm not too. Why, why not? I, are you an educator or an indoctrinator? I'm an educator. Well, then put my series I, in there. Put, I'll I'll put my series why, in there. I'll Come on. Why, I'll tell you why I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do it for the same reason I'm not going to put literature about the earth being flat or vaccines causing autism, things like that, because there's no evidence for it. And in science, we the things we teach in the classroom are things that are supported by the evidence, uh -huh. and things that are a consensus position that have that have convinced people with expertise based on the evidence that this is the best explanation we have and you haven't convinced me of that. So until you do, it doesn't go in the classroom. Now, if you do, if you, if you come up with an idea tomorrow that you can, you can test neutral variation, um, you know, a, a way that you can use neutral variation to test your model of creation, then I'm all ears, but you haven't okay. done that. Well, tell you what, come to Lenox, Alabama, Southern Alabama, North of Pensacola, a little bitty town of 40 people. Yeah, I'll I, take, I, I lived in Auburn. I lived in Auburn. I, I, okay. Well, I, we're just a two miles off of I-65. I'll, yeah, take I you, I'll take you to lunch and give you a tour of our place and show you what we teach here. And we can, we can try to get you straightened out. Now, Herman, last question. I got to go. Are you content to die someday with your beliefs and face, if there is a creator, what's going to happen to you when you stand before him? That well, will happen. You know? I, 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 the only way I can respond to that is, is, is through a biblical reference. And I'm sorry I don't have the memory for Bible verses that you have, but uh, in Ecclesiastes, that the verse where the dead know nothing. And I, I believe that. And I also believe in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which says we should love our family and do good work and, and all that, because at the end of the day, there, there is nothing left. And I'm happy with that. I'm fine. Okay. I'm not. I don't need anything else other than the life that I've been given. And I know we got to wrap right. this up here, guys. Uh, Ken, I'll tell you what, though. Um, I am familiar with with most of your seminars, as you as you know, and we've had discussions going back a very long time. Matter of fact, you probably don't remember, but we actually had a discussion long before our uh, debates with King Crocoduck and uh, Bill Lolo is going back several several years ago. We had a discussion dealing with some radiometric stuff, um, dealing with some carbon dating claims. Um, the next podcast we have that we have you on because you have been gracious enough to come join us many times and I do thank you for that I really do honestly mean very thank you for your time that you've, you've given to us um, I will one-on-one -on -one have a conversation with you with the Young Earth Creationist Claims going through your Creationist Handbook the ninth edition which I'm quite familiar with um, would you be willing to do something along those lines sure anytime yeah I'd be glad to okay so I, I want to thank both you gentlemen. Um, again, both you guys have given us more than enough time um, to talk about these topics. I think there was very a very, very spirited very debate. I know we're going to have to do some, some editing on this because of technical difficulties. So please bear with us. It's not to try to, um, to eliminate any of the conversation. Okay. So, but yes. Dr. Mays, thank you guys. awesome. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks a lot. Kent, I, thank you. Once again, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Kent.